My name is Dr. Patrick Soon Cheong, and I'm here today to present to you the science behind the coronavirus. I really think it's really important for us to present some of the signs because it's very clear to me that there's a lot of fear out there and what adds to the sphere is confusion. But if you could present the science and really try and understand not only how does this coronavirus work, how does it infect the body, what does it do, and how we can actually attack it, we have an opportunity to really uh, provide some peace of mind, some level of control in the hands not of every individual, but the entire community. <clears throat> I'm really excited by the fact that this cor coronavirus has attacked us in 2003, and we have the benefit of that insight and scientific knowledge. But we also today have tools that we didn't have then. We have more genomics, we have more bioinformatics, we have supercomputing. And together with those tools, I think we have a real shot at not only defeating this virus, but overcoming this pandemic. So in order for me to take you through this uh, complex story of this coronavirus today, we will talk about how do we understand this virus? How does the virus infect your body? And more importantly, explain the symptoms that are associated with this infection. What can we do to control and prevent its spread? And excitingly, what is on the horizon that the entire world scientists as a community are working together to cure this infection and prevent us from getting this in the first place? There are some questions we won't be able to fully answer yet, is how long is this pandemic, will this pandemic last? I think it's important that this uh, one hour special will have a separate, maybe a slightly different lens. While the world is wor working on very significantly on how to kill the virus, we want to take this lens of what does this virus do to your body, i.e. the host, and how can we prevent it getting into your body, into the cells? How can we actually treat the host or the patient to prevent it becoming a severe fatal disease? So while on the one hand, uh, we were working hard to develop a vaccine, and I think it's important and realistically important for us to identify a treatment now for those that are severely ill. Let me start on what is the coronavirus. You've seen a lot of names, coronavirus, COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, SARS, and they all in essence mean the exact same thing here. This virus is a RNA virus. What I mean by that, the genetic signature inside this virus, that little curly is made of a RNA that can reproduce. But most importantly, the virus has on its surface a envelope or a capsule, and then you see the spikes, and the spikes form a crown, and that's why it's called coronavirus. In 2019, it created this disease in China, and that's what COVID-19 was the first name. Uh, coronavirus disease in 2019, COVID-19. And now the World Health Organization has created an official name. This is the latest scientific name, SARS-CoV-2. And why SARS-CoV-2? Because this is a second generation daughter virus of SARS, and why is that important to us? Well, it's given us a head start. It's given the scientists a head start since 2003, 2004, 2005 to fully understand this family of coronaviruses, specifically SARS and now SARS-CoV-2. What's exciting about that is we now have in our fingertips supercomputing, genomics, bioinformatics that wasn't as advanced even in 2003 and this is now allowing us to understand how contagious is this coronavirus. Because sadly, this mutation has allowed SARS-CoV-2 to become a thousand times more infective than that of SARS. And that is the fear. The fear is SARS was an endemic, limited in its scale and scope, but now SARS-CoV-2 is a pandemic. So the question that we need to understand is how does this enter your body? What does this do? How does it affect the cell? How does it get, affect the lung? And uh, what organs does it affect? I think this is an opportunity for us to take a different lens of understanding the host effects 
rather than just the virus itself. And if we look at that host effects, we now truly have a shot at trying to block it and block the ability to get to SARS. So firstly, is an infected person has the ability to contaminate 2.6 other patients. And how does that happen? Well, it's droplets, and this uh, nanoparticle of a virus forms droplets, and these droplets can go on surfaces, and they go into your hand. The important fact is that your hand is now a vector. We'll come back to how we can use that fact to our advantage and kill the virus. But the lungs, what happens inside the cell? Well, this virus has now hijacked this receptor in our body called the ACE2 receptor. This receptor is on blood vessels, this receptor is on kidney and even on heart, but most importantly on the, what we call the alveolar cells of the lung. It's in a very important receptor called ACE2 because it's there in your body to protect your lung tissue from injury. What has happened is this virus through its spikes has figured out a way to interact with that receptor and use that receptor to dock. The virus goes on now to take advantage of the cell itself and use the cell as a factory. It's now taken on what we call taking the RNA inside the, the virus itself, it breaks it up and remarkably takes the, what we call the Golgi apparatus, the, the, the machinery of the human cell to reproduce itself and repackage and in so doing, it, it propagates. So this is the issue of how the virus actually regenerates and sheds. Now we are full circle because that shedding of that positively charged patient has ability to contaminate others. And the opportunity, however, to stop, not just unfortunately the shedding, but stop that pr propagation is what containment is all about. Not only is this virus highly contagious, but it is also deadly. And this is the map or the results that the Chinese have put out with regard to the patent of disease progression in China. And there are three types of symptoms or patients, the mild, moderate, severe, and critical. And what you see from this is the patients that are severe and critical progress very rapidly to the intensive care unit and rapidly to death. This can happen as rapidly as three to four weeks. But it doesn't exclude the patients who are mild or moderate. While rare, it doesn't exclude them. And this chart, uh, again, of 44,000 cases uh, in mainland China has separated the fatality as it relates to age. And as one could see from this chart, the yellow is that greater than 80 and 70 to 79 and 60 to 69 are the predominant uh, patients who die from this disease. But unfortunately, there are deaths in patients who are 40 to 49, 30 to 39, 20 to 29, and even 10 to 19. So while it's certainly um, the majority of patients have mild symptoms, the young aren't protected yet from this fatality rate. And why does this happen? Well, the way this virus works is as it replicates and it becomes, um, overtakes this protective ACE2 receptor, fibrosis occurs, meaning scarring. And that's why 100% of these patients who have uh, fatalities have this ground glass effect in their lungs and there's no longer any oxygenation. The body tries to, to take this over. Sadly, we end up then with what we call SARS, which is severe acute respiratory syndrome in which, in, in essence, uh, it is impossible for the body to get enough oxygen to the rest of the organs, and we have what we call multi-organ failure. This happens, unfortunately, not only uh, mainly in the elderly, but also those with pre-existing conditions. And as you could see, patients with cardiovascular disease, diabetes, 
respiratory disease and high blood pressure uh, have these pre-existing uh, conditions or uh, are prone, if they get infected, to end up with SARS. We are now learning on a day-by-day -day basis what are the clinical effects of SARS. We are understanding and beginning to sort of see hypertension, severe hypertension, cardiac failure, and even a very interesting finding of uh, low potassium in the blood. So the Chinese, again, are putting out this data in rapid fashion and allowing clinicians and uh, people who are looking after such patients to find ways to combat the SARS. It is also important for us to understand these are the patients who will require ICU. And we'll talk a little bit again about flattening the curve. We have, really have an opportunity as an entire community and as a country to not only flatten the curve, but not overwhelm the healthcare system so that the ICUs and this medical staff can be available to treat these patients, not only with these pre-existing conditions, but to take a patient from critical and severe all the way back to moderate and mild. It is important for all of us to understand the ability for this virus to spread and how it does so. It has a spreading factor of about 2.6, and what does that mean? The New York Times has put together a video that I think beautifully explains the real contagious capability of this virus. Let's imagine there were five people who are sick, and one cycle meaning it's within this five people. Well, if there is an infection rate of 2.6, and that's mathematically we call it exponential, what would happen within two cycles, that would become 18 people who are sick. Three cycles, 52 people are sick. Four cycles, 140 people are sick. And after five cycles, we have over 300 people that are sick. This is what we mean by isolating people that are infected. This was, by the way, the value of the test. The purpose of isolating people who are sick is to flatten the curve. What we mean by that is if we can identify these patients that are ill, we can actually, with protective measures or with isolation, flatten the curve. And the importance of flattening that curve is we can protect the healthcare system's capacity so that we can actually have sufficient ICUs, sufficient medical personnel, sufficient medical supplies to deal with the inevitable, sadly inevitable, severe and critically ill patients who may die from this disease. So it's beholden to all of us to work together to identify those patients or, or yourselves or your family members or your friends of visits from overseas who may have the symptoms of this disease and either self-isolate even without a test because it's critical for all of us to create the extinction of this virus by self-isolating and allowing then the healthcare system to manage with the very ill patient. If we have to self-isolate or have patients isolate so they prevent this exponential uh, growth of this uh, pandemic. We need to understand what are the symptoms, even without a test. So this is the issue uh, we can, and through the experience again of the Chinese, understand how do we recognize at least an infection. We need to know who is most vulnerable, are men more at risk, are children at risk. We need to ask the question, how long does the virus stay in your body? With regard to the last question, uh, disturbingly, there's now some reports that the virus can stay in your body for more than 30 days. So the first question then is to recognize either uh, yourself, your friend, your family member that has an infection. And this is a report, again, from the Chinese experience of over um, thousands of cases. And here is Huan City, Hubei province, and the country as a whole, where the Chinese rapidly got out the information that fever and cough, a dry cough, are some of the hallmarks of this infection. So anybody with a fever or dry cough should suspect, uh, without a test even, and go to the extent of self-isolating. 
and prevent then this contamination either amongst um, their family members, their friends and their co-workers. What's of concern, however, is what percentage are severe or, or critical. I think what, uh, the good news is that 81% of symptoms are mild, but the concern is in patients with pre-existing conditions in the elderly. If you take again this case report now, 44,000 confirmed cases in mainland China, you see from their experience, patients who require hospitalization, they call that severe or critical in intensive care. If you add those together, that represents 18%. So if you then extrapolate what potentially could happen in our country and the number of patients that could get infected, and then say 18% of such patients will require hospitalization or intensive care units. That means we need sufficient beds. That means we need sufficient ICU personnel. That means we need to preserve at all costs the resources of the healthcare system. That is why I can emphasize so much that we need to flatten this curve and not generate this peak. Because if we generate this peak and 18% are severely or critically ill, there is no way our country, our system, has the capacity to manage that onslaught or what I call this tsunami. However, it's in our control. I'm going to talk a little bit about the science of soap, simple things like the science of soap and the power of soap, this idea of washing your hands that you're told is a kindergarten days is not trivial as it relates to this disease. It's not trivial as it relates to not overwhelming the healthcare system. And it's not trivial in, in terms of exponentially spreading this disease. The purpose of this presentation was not only to try and allay fears, but also to provide information that we as a community and as a nation can actually control. So I really feel it was important for me to speak about the science of soap. Because we can not only control, we can prevent the spread. I, I'll speak a little bit about how long does the viruses last on, services, on the surfaces, with the surfaces of your hand or surfaces of your computer, your phone, and how we can do containment. Lessons we could learn from China. And then we'll speak a little bit about the role of testing, lessons we can learn from Korea. I recognize that we are in a little bit of a bind because of the lack of testing. But I think what we are, what, what we can do now is understand that perhaps even without testing, we can now control and prevent the spread. So let me speak about the science of soap. The viruses are not bacteria. So antibacterial soap is a myth in, as it relates to killing the viruses because it has this fatty, greasy layer on its, as an envelope, loves getting onto surfaces that will, to which it will adhere, such as your hand. So your hand is a vector. But if you took this vector of the hand and understood the science of soap, where the virus has this fatty layer and the skin is the surface, detergent, straightforward, regular detergent, dishwasher fluid, hair shampoo, detergent, soap, acts as a surfactant, what does that mean? It actually goes and orientates itself, these soap particles, towards the fatty layer of the virus. And in so doing, it actually orientates and lifts off these viruses and creates this clean surface. So we have the ability to understand that the science of soap, its natural ability to act as a detergent, the ability, the reason why you need at least 20 seconds, because your hands have nooks and crannies. You need the detergent to enter onto and create this interaction with the virus. You then need to rub and wash because you need it to be lift, lifted from the surfaces. However, what's exciting about this virus is because it is a enveloped virus. And that, by the way, is its Achilles heel. Because what does the soap do? The soap has an ability to crack that envelope. And if it cracks that envelope, you're able to kill that virus. So each one of us has the ability to be washing your hands and cracking that envelope 
in preventing the spread. This is the power and the science of soap. What have we learned from Korea? Well, it turns out to prevent the overwhelming of the healthcare system, and in fact, to protect healthcare workers, one can do drive-by testing. And I think this is a national initiative which we should take on and learn this experience from Korea. What have we learned from China? China has taken the draconian step of containment. We are unfortunately beyond that point now. And so we are now left then, therefore, with the opportunity to control it, at least within your control, of actually taking on the power and the science of soap. The question is always asked, what is the hope for a cure today? And also, what can we do to prevent infection in the first place? Well, as we talked about what we can do to prevent infection in the first place, is this issue of self-containment, washing your hands, the power of soap. And frankly, the most important, one of the most important things is the elbow bump. Stop doing handshaking. The issue of the cure is a complex issue because we have to talk about what is the difference between a treatment for those that are ill versus what is a vaccine that will prevent the infection from happening. And I'll try and address that. I'll try and explain the difference between a treatment and a vaccine. But I think we also would like to discuss what new treatments are being developed today. And I'm excited to say that the entire world community of scientists and pharmaceutical companies and biotechnology companies are frantically working 24 seven to find new treatments that are being developed. I'll have to address uh, with uh, scientific vigor about how long will a vaccine take to develop. But I think of great concern is what is our manufacturing capacity? Should we uh, need some of these vaccines or these treatments urgently? So let's start. Uh, the first question is, uh, how long will it take to develop a treatment or vaccine? First, let's even talk about what's the difference between a treatment versus a vaccine, because I think there's a lot of confusion around there. A vaccine is like that what you have for flu. We create a shot, a subcutaneous shot, and using a vector, uh, sometimes a common cold vector, or what we call an adenovirus, in which we put the sequence of this uh, SARS-CoV-2 into this to train and educate your body to recognize this virus and have readily available killer cells to prevent you getting infected. That's a vaccine. Unfortunately, that'll take a while to develop because testing needs to be done about the effectiveness of that vaccine in giving you true protection. On the other hand, we have patients that are ill, critically ill, mildly ill, that we can take a patient that is mildly ill and prevent it from becoming critically ill. We can take a patient that's critically ill from becoming severely to the point of fatal, fatally ill and to understand how we can do that. I think treatment for these kinds of patients are much closer at hand. This virus works by hijacking a receptor in your body. It takes this receptor, uses the machinery of the lung, and actually replicates and infects the lung to the point of fibrosis and death. Worse, this virus has found a way to evade the immune system. It's found a way to actually kill the natural killer cells in your body, the T cells in your body. From the data again from China, what we've discovered is that the patients who die, not only are they elderly, but they have a low natural killer cell and T cell count. So we're beginning to understand this complex biology of this virus. And that's why I'm saying we're looking at it from a perspective, not about the virus, but the host. So if we could understand the host's reaction and create counter reactions to this, we have a shot for treatment. So let me speak a little bit about treatment. There are multiple strategies. The first strategy is to take this concept that the virus has hijacked this receptor in our human body called the ACE. So this ACE receptor is the first port of entry. So if we could block the entry 
of this virus through this ACE receptor, we could block the entire cascade of its ability to use the engine and the machinery to regenerate. Well, happily and luckily, we have now have scientists, and this is as recently as this month, understanding this ACE receptor through the power of genomics, through the power of supercomputing, through the power of protein folding, this complex receptor in our human body is now being be able to understood. And because we can understand this receptor, we can find systems to create decoys and sponges so that this receptor cannot be attacked so that the virus can be, uh, as a Trojan horse, blocked from entering this. This complex science is now being attacked worldwide by scientists around the world and is a very exciting strategy. The other strategy is to say, could we block the machinery? And the answer to that is yes, because we now understand how this virus replicates. The third strategy is could we block the, what we call the endosomal packaging and block that. And what's exciting is we've now discovered potentially, and I say this potentially because science is not fully uh, borne out, and this is an experience in China, that old uh, drugs repurposed can actually block these packaging systems inside the cell of the human cell and ameliorate this disease. And a fourth strategy is to actually kill the factory of the virus itself. It turns out the way this virus works, it has found a way to kill the natural killer cells and T cells of the human body. From the results we've seen from China uh, in the patients who had a, fa a fatal outcome in the elderly, the lymphocytes, or what we call the natural killer cells and T cells, are depleted, significantly depleted. Whether that's an effect of the virus or whether the patients are immunosuppressed or had pre-existing conditions, including cancer, uh, it's not clear yet. But what is important and is clear is that these natural killer cells or T cells are depleted. However, we have in our innate system the ability to kill infected cells. So a very interesting strategy is to activate these natural killer cells that, as you could see from this diagram, has an ability to identify, lock on to, and, and really push what they call granzymes and into these cells and destroy them. The way it will destroy them, it will actually completely almost dissolve the cell. And in so doing, we can then kill the factory itself. So the opportunity here now is not to affect the virus, but the factory of the virus and, de and prevent its depletion. And in so doing, it may in induce also uh, a memory or a vaccine and maybe even have a dual effect of reducing the infection, killing the infected cell, and allowing the patient's own immune system to get reactivated. That, these are the four opportunities that now face us as strategies for the scientific community to come together and work frantically towards, number one, blocking the receptor, preventing it from entering. Number two, destroying the machinery, preventing it from replicating. Number three, preventing from repackaging and shedding. And number four, killing the factory itself. These are opportunities that gives us hope. And I hope will provide some level of comfort that the world working together uh, will be able to find a way to stop this virus, stop this pandemic, and learn a lot about infectious diseases. I think the question that many people are asking is how long will this pandemic last? What is the duration of the viral load in the patient? Is there any hope that this pandemic will die out? And I think it's very important for us as scientists uh, uh, to explain what we know and explain what we don't know. At this point, I don't think we really understand or know how long this pandemic will last. It could be months, many months, one of the earliest reports is the duration of this viral load in an infected patient lasts, uh, 
in a range of 35 to 37, 38 days. And whether a patient can actually reinfect itself, himself, I think is not quite clear yet. I think the hope that this pandemic will die out, I'm sure with the uh, work of the community of scientists, then we will find a, a way to prevent the regeneration of this particular virus. And I'm convinced that with all the community of scientists working on this disease, a vaccine will be found. But I think it's also important to dispel some myths. The question was that come up as, can I get SARS virus from my pets? Again, it's an unanswered question because there's now just been a recent report of a infected dog from Hong Kong. But the question is, could that pet reinfect humans? There's no evidence today yet that it's transmitted from pets to humans. It's a human to human uh, contact. And these are the kinds of uh, information that we will be able to say to you, we don't know. As important, I think it's important for us not to enter into conversations such as xenophobia. This is a pandemic that affects the world. This is a pandemic where uh, the, the entire world working together can overcome it. The Chinese, while it started there, this now is across the entire planet. And the Chinese have put out very important scientific and clinical information. And so the concept now of xenophobia is one of the most destructive things I think we can do as it relates to public health and the opportunity for scientists to work together. The public-private relationship, the ability of governments to work together, the ability for the, for the community to work together is so critical for us to beat this disease. I'm confident we will do that. I'm confident the science of today will enable us to do that. So with that, um, I'm sure we'll have questions on coronavirus, more questions on coronavirus. Um, please feel free to send us your questions uh, or by email to uh, coronavirus at letimes.com and we'll try our best to answer them as we go through uh, this understanding of the science behind cor coronavirus and try to not only allay fears, but put you in control of this disease.